of our crisis relief hub ribbon cutting and open house for Edgewater Health. And um, our first speaker, we're gonna have Dr. Danita Johnson Woods, our president and CEO of Edgewater Health. Thank you, Thank you so much, Tara. Um, again, we apologize for the delay, but we're waiting for Mayor Melton to arrive. And since we've got him sort of down on the agenda, he should probably be here well before we get towards the end, but this won't take very long. Ah, and as I speak, he walks through the door. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Speak to the mic. Am I speaking into the mic? Yeah, so we can. Thank you. Okay, very good, very good. Well, once again, to all of you, good morning. Uh, some of you were here earlier for our steering committee meeting. Um, actually, it's our very first organized steering committee meeting, and so I am very thankful and very grateful to the people who showed up this morning for that steering committee, because the purpose of that committee is to advise us, give us guidance, and work with us to support the Crisis Relief Hub, which you're going to hear a lot about this morning. And as was mentioned, I'm Dr. Janita Johnson Woods. I'm the president and CEO for Edgewater. And again, I wanna welcome all of you who are here to help us launch our Crisis Relief Hub. And it is an extension actually of the crisis services that we've done for many years, but now there's a much more intense focus on crisis services across the country. And just really, especially in our state, there's a big focus on that. And so what our Crisis Relief Hub Hub consists of our three pillars. It's the 988 crisis, um, state crisis hotline. It is also the mobile crisis response team, for which we'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that in a minute. And it is the crisis stabilization services unit, which this facility that you're sitting in will provide a lot of that service. And so we refer to the center as the RAC the Rapid Access Center, where people can come in, they can get services quickly, um, get stabilized, and be moved out. But if there is a need for longer-term intervention, we can do that as well. So you hear a little bit about that. Uh, and I do want to say today, Edgewater finally received our designation as a mobile crisis response team. So we have been working very hard on that. And for those of you who don't know, and you'll, again, you'll hear more about it, what the Mobile Crisis Response Team is, it's a group of people. And we've got like at least one team, probably two now, that are ready to go out. They all are made up of a certified peer support specialist and a clinician. So two people will always go out on a call and uh, respond to, they will do the runs, they will respond to any crisis in the community. The other thing about this particular facility is that although we will be doing runs to assist with crises that may happen in the community, this is also a facility where a person who just feels like they need help, they can walk into. If they feel like they're in crisis, they can walk into the facility and get services. They can also be referred by an, another system, such as a hospital system. They might have somebody sitting in their emergency room and who's experiencing a psychiatric crisis and they don't know what to do with them. So they can call one of our team members and we'll respond immediately. So that is our goal, to make sure that we respond to that. The other thing that I wanna make note of is that the RAC, this facility that you're sitting in today, it is really, it represents a significant milestone in the history of our organization because it was the first in the state to be designated to do crisis services as a crisis stabilization unit. So I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> but what we intend to do is we want to rely on our collaboration with the various organizations, stakeholders that many of them are represented in this room. Law enforcement, local hospitals, social services, and other providers. And with that support and with with, with their referrals, what we want to do is provide medical evaluation, subacute stabilization, and we can also provide withdrawal management. So sometimes the crisis might be that a person is experiencing symptoms from withdrawal, from some sort of an addictive disorder. 
and that could be a crisis as well. So there are several kinds of crises, and if they are experiencing that, they can come to this facility as well, either by referral, by a walk-in, or however. So they can come as well, and they will receive the treatment that they need. Our goal is to quickly stabilize people, get them the appropriate supports that they need, and get them back out in the community and functioning at the most optimal level possible. Sometimes it takes a little longer for some. You know, we may not be able to stabilize them in two hours, five hours, or less than 24 hours, 23 hours. But what we are equipped to do is to continue to provide the services that they need on a longer term basis. If that's two days, if that's two weeks, we can continue to provide those services and continue to surround them with the supportive services that they need to get them back out in the community. So this today, this press conference, this uh, community convening, it really represents a milestone on our journey. And we're really thankful for all of you who have joined us here at Edgewater. And as I mentioned, we're rolling out a 988 mobile crisis line today. And we're just bringing together all the resources that we need to create that crisis uh, ecosystem to surround individuals in our community who may need those services. Those services to be a support to families, who may need the services, who can call on us. And so we want to involve everyone who is experiencing a crisis or has a family member or a friend who's experiencing a crisis to contact us so that we can assist you with that. Um, and the steering committee, I have to say a little bit about that because that also is a resource. And over time, we would like to have the steering committee disseminate information to the community, help us to understand best practices in a crisis care, and help us to improve local community outcomes, make sure that we're responsive and that we're doing those things to address the many um, issues that we might have in our community. So we are very pleased to have their input as well. So again, I wanna thank you all for coming, but I'd like to take a moment to introduce those people who are sitting up here who will also have an opportunity to speak. I want to take a minute to introduce Dr. Sharon Johnson Shirley. She's on the far side, and she is one of Edgewater's longtime board members. She's our, actually our current board chair, and she's the chair of the Ambassadors for Edgewater, which is a foundation that helps to raise, it does friend development and fund development for Edgewater Systems, or Edgewater Health. And all of you probably know her in her other roles. She's a member of the Board of Advisors. She's on the Executive Committee, and she's the chair for Indiana University Northwest. Her daytime job, if she can fit it in with all that other stuff, <laughs> she is the superintendent of Lake Ridge New Tech Schools. And so I want to thank Dr. Shirley for being here. Next, I have I'd like to take a moment to introduce a man that we all know. Him, so he doesn't take a lot of introduction, but this is our first con congressional district of Indiana's representative to the U.S. Congress, Frank Mervan, and you'll hear from him shortly. So thank you for being here with us. We're also fortunate on that far end, we have Bernard Carter, Lake County Prosecutor. Most of you know him as well, and he has served many years as an Edgewater Health Board member, so we're so lucky and so blessed. Um, he was instrumental actually in um, Edgewater Health receiving our de designation as the backbone organization for Lake County from the National My Brothers Keepers Alliance. Um, it's a collective impact organization that's established by President Obama. It was established in 2014 and MBK focuses on six milestones to remove barriers to success for boys and young men of color. And we're so proud that Bernie is the person that led us here. He's providing the leadership and the service, and he's been doing all of this work since we established that group in 2023. And again, that group is made up of about, I think, probably about 60 stakeholders right now. And so as we continue along this journey, you'll be hearing much more about that, MBK serving young boys, men, boys and young men, but we're also establishing a group to serve young ladies and girls. So we'll be establishing that group in the near future, but right now we're working on certification for that particular group. So I, again, thank you, Bernie, for bringing us to this point. And finally, we all know Mayor Melton. He's here to join us today, 
and we thank him for continuing his support for Edgewater Health. Uh, again, it's been a 50-year commitment for us, providing mental health supports for people in our community, as well as now primary care supports for all of those. And so we have a pretty expanded network of um, facilities and services from a continuum, a full continuum of mental health services, including housing supports, uh, addressing food insecurities, and we're now, we, and have been since 2016, I believe, we've entered that primary care role. And so we have a number of staff here who work with us in our integrated model that delivers both mental health care and primary health care. So we're so pleased to have that. And again, thank you, Mayor Melton, because mm -hmm. he's played a significant role in that as well, because people come through our doors, sometimes they say for a, a reason or a season, and he graced our doors many years ago. He actually came to work for us for a while and helped us with our youth programs. And so thank you for that as well. And so with that, I'm going to, I'd like to take one moment to acknowledge all of the elected officials in the room. I did notice uh, Dr. Smith sitting over there. Is there anyone else that I might be missing? But we want to say thank you for coming out and joining us. If there's anybody else, if you could stand up. I just don't want to miss anyone. So thank you for that. And we just thank you for your service. Congressman, um, Representative Smith, your time and your talent, because we call on you guys a lot. So thank you for that. And I'd like to also acknowledge the many Edgewater Health employees who are standing here, many of them who have worked very deliberately on this particular project. And if you could just stand for a moment and let people see who you are. We've got our providers, we've got our support staff, we've got a number of people. We're kind of standing all around the room already, so I want to thank you all for that. And uh, again, we're excited to expand our services and look forward, forward to partnering with all of you to achieve the best pos possible outcomes for our residents. So thank you for that. And I would like to ask Dr. Shirley if she'd like to come up and say a few words. And Dr. Shirley will be followed by uh, Mer uh, Congressman Mervan, and and then there will be Prosecutor Bernie Carter, and then finally, thank you, finally, our Mayor, Eddie Melton. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Woods, for all of kind words. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Let's give yourselves a round of applause for being here today because I know your schedules are busy. Thank you for being here. Again, as she said, I'm Dr. Sharon Johnson Shirley, and I'm superintendent of the Lake Ridge New Tech Schools. And today, I am welcoming you to this momentous occasion as chairperson for the Edgewater's Health Board of Directors. I'd like to thank my fellow board members who are in attendance today. And would you all please stand and be acknowledged, the board members that are present. <laughs> we thank you and we appreciate you, as well as our local elected officials who made time to celebrate with us today. We are so pleased to have you. I have served on Edgewater's Health Board for many years, and I'm incredibly proud to have witnessed Edgewater's growth from its beginning in behavioral care services to its expansion into family medicine. Its opening of the Cedar Lake Clinic in 2021 with an emphasis on family medicine and women's health its expansion into the Maryville community with family and integrative medicine in 2023, and now expanded crisis service at this historical location of the Rapid Access Center. Let's give that a round of applause. I am proud to play a role in an organization that can boast 50 years of steady growth and give back to the community. Edgewater health is still growing strong. We are proud to be able to partner with the state on 988, a suicide and a crisis lifeline for citizens 
who may be experiencing extreme anxiety, isolation from family and friends, and who just feel they have nowhere to turn. We are proud, and I say proud, to stand up our mobile crisis response team to meet with the community when and where it's needed. And this facility, the RAC, is a resource we can all be proud of, and its continued success depends on you. EMTs, law enforcement, hospital personnel, social service agencies, and all the stakeholders that are represented here today. On that note, let's have a few words from Representative Marvan. Congressman, you have the floor. <laughs> I, uh, I, I want to thank everyone. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Woods and Dr. Johnson for your commitment and dedication to this community. Mayor, thank you for hosting us here in your wonderful city. All of the stakeholders and all of you who are here today who uh, believe strongly when we're unified, we can make a difference in our community. Uh, it's a critical step forward in addressing mental health in our community today. Uh, the opening of this mobile crisis center, it uh, represents hope, compassion, and a lifeline to those who need it most in their darkest time. Uh, I think it's important to understand that um, individuals who face this feel isolated. They feel alone. They feel like no one is there for them. And many obstacles arise for those who are facing those difficult times. In Edgewater in this crisis center, mobile crisis center, will meet people where they are. And as I was sitting respectfully, in my assigned seat. Uh, I was thinking about uh, real life scenarios. Uh, I was a township trustee for 15 years, saw a lot of people who faced mental health and addiction issues. And within my own family, uh, and Bernard Carter, I hope, will speak to this, uh, there were individuals who faced trauma, who turned child or childhood trauma that turned to opiates. And as a family, we felt that we didn't know where to turn. And we watched this uh, play out in front of us of hopelessness and someone who was addicted to opiates and they isolated themselves. We didn't know how to help them and they're no longer with us and they left three children behind. And so I only mention that story because I would imagine many of us have that story within our families or friends or associates who have faced either mental health or addiction and have thought that they were the only ones that were facing it at that time. And so today, in our own way, gives us the power to be able to reach out to those individuals and tell them they are not alone and that help is on the way. And Edgewater has heard their call for assistance. And so I also had a, uh, a brief encounter with nurse practitioner Dido. If you can raise your hand, nurse practitioner, she's at about one o'clock. She's been here uh, for a long time, has worked her way up, and now is a nurse practitioner. And I had asked her, you know, what is your why? Why are you here at Edgewater? And she had said because she had noticed her real life experiences of people having, not having a voice and we're facing addiction, that she wanted to be able to help. And what I've realized in my humble life experiences is there is no greater force in the universe than those who have faced trauma wanting to make a difference for others. So as we go forward as I'm your member of Congress, I will continue to make sure that there are grants and funding available so that Edgewater as the old theory, the starfish, can help individuals one at a time, but that the community can have the resources necessary to assist those in need, that we can be present in the community, in Gary, in Northwest Indiana, so that we can make a difference. And so I'm honored to be here today to be able to start the ripple effect, to let the community know that help is on the way, we will meet you where you are, and you are not alone. I thank you all for what you do, all the stakeholders, and everyone who is shaking a head right now. Let us go out and make a difference in our community. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a great day. Very much so. Dr. Wood, the mayor, Mr. Congressman. You know, it's a pleasure for me to be here in, in many reasons. You know, we in law enforcement talk about toolboxes. If anybody know what that means, a toolbox. We want we take a toolbox and we put tools in it. And this is a tool that can be utilized in law enforcement. I'm here to say very much so. You know, I'm so familiar with police work, and I, and I see it every day. And I see it on the television. I see it in Lake County. I see it in Illinois in particular. Incidents that I say it could have been avoided. It absolutely could have been avoided. That's the worst feeling in the world for someone's life to be taken, and we know it could have been avoided. Well, this is an answer to some of that. It absolutely is. And I see the interfaith uh, 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 ministers here. Could you all stand up? Because you guys have been in this journey also. We've all, we've all been in this journey. Thank you very much for attending today, and thank you for everything that you do, because you see what we see, the necessity and the need for it. So we really appreciate that. But can you imagine, though, it's, it's, it's the worst feeling in the world when someone takes their life or someone else's life is taken because of mental illness. You know, uh, I would say in law enforcement, this is an aid that we definitely need, no doubt about it. Now, the problem with that is, in, in many cases, and I'll be very honest, law enforcement is truly not trained to do what we expect <coughs> them to do when it comes to mental, handling mentally ill individuals. And truly, they're not. They try to do the best they can. They read about it. They, get, they have conferences on it, and they get some you know, two-hour training. You know, that's not enough. Not what we're dealing with. It is not enough. So to come here and recognize what Edgewater Health is doing, the Alliance is doing, and other people in our community is doing, is so of necessity. We will save lives, there's no doubt about it. So how, you know, when you got something so sure that you're gonna save lives, it's a good thing. Everybody agree with that? Yes. And, and I, so, I've been wanting this for so long here in Lake County. I've been wanting this for so long because I, I sit at the television, I sit at my desk, and I see situations that I read that I know for a fact could be avoided. You know, one of the things we want everyone to do is put in your phone the numbers for the, for the call out. Everyone, because you don't know when you might observe something, what might happen in your environment, might happen in your home, or you might be driving down the street and say, this is a situation I think could be dealt with um, by this unit. Put that in and make a phone call. Give it to other people. I think everyone in our community Everyone. I know I will talk about it everywhere I go, but I think everyone should program this in their phone and in their mind to say, I will utilize these services when I see something that can be adjusted. But if they come out and it's not what we thought it was, that's fine. If they come out and be able to assist, that's fine. Now, one of the things when I talk to Dr. Johnson, I'm sorry, Dr. Woods, <laughs> one of the things is we have to understand that there's a need for law enforcement. The mayor knows that because he has a whole police department. There's a need for law enforcement, but we, so we have to know when the police should be called and utilized or in addition to this unit. I kind of think in addition myself, uh, because when you get to those scenes and you get, if there's a gun involved or a knife involved or violence, serious violence, you need law enforcement there. But if it's a family member getting out of hand and the family knows, and you've heard a situation where they said, I wish I had not, and I use this many times, I wish I had not called the police. Because her son is laying on the, on the living room floor dead. And she, she said, I wish I would not have called the police. We don't want nobody having that feeling. We don't want nobody to be strapped with that. No one should feel that way in terms of, I can't call the police because my child may die. So this is a kind of an answer to that or an assistance to that. It really is. Now, if it gets to the point where uh, someone is out there from this unit and they see it's a little bit above their head, they're definitely going to call the police. The police will be notified in addition to that. But you need specialized people to do what we're venturing to do, and we have that. Uh, Edgewater Health has built the whole background. they got every component that they need. They're not missing any component to this unit. And I love the fact when I see that. I love the fact when I see that. You know, um, there's talk about statistics, and it was talking about 44% of the people who go into the prisons have some mental Ill illness. And they, and they give other statistics on terms of treatment that they're not getting. I would venture to say, in all honesty, from my observation, 
and being in the court and doing cases and things of that nature, it's probably as high as 50% of individuals who come into the criminal justice system has some mental disorder. 50%, every other. Because you know, in, in general, people are good people. The average person in this room, obviously, is good people. You're not gonna cause any harm. Well, our citizens are the same way. But when they get involved with drug addiction, when they get involved with some mental illness, that person changed. I've seen people I grew up with was as equal to me, if not greater. I had a brother who, obviously, I grew up with, and he was a heroin addict. And I saw the behavior and what he went through, and he ultimately OD'd and died. So I see it personally, and it's personal to me. And he exhibited a mental illness type personality, then he coupled that with, with alcohol and then heroin. See what I'm saying? Because there's multiple reasons for, for what they do. And we will be able to address those. And I love the fact about walk-ins, because I get people saying, where do I go? How much do I have to pay? Uh, you know, first thing, let's get you some help. So the walk-in is absolutely so essential here at Edgewater Health. So I'm here just to say from a law enforcement standpoint, this is a blessing to all of us. It is something that we can utilize. It's something that we can um, be trained on. And that's another thing when I, when I talk to Dr. Woods. Well, they're willing, this unit is willing to train every police officer in their collective area. What is it? And they will sit down with them and give them some training as to how to respond, what to do when they're not around, and also try to encourage them to utilize this unit. Because I know and I hope and, I, and the mayor might address that issue. I would love for the mayor, obviously, and, he, and he's here and he's always been a great supporter of Edgewater, as well as his city. That the police department has to get on board and accept the fact that this is a tool that they can put in their toolbox. That's all we're asking. Put it in their toolbox and utilize it. And we'll all get safe, a place to live. I want to thank you and I certainly want to thank the mayor for being here and supporting uh, Edgewater. I'm on the board, so I'm pushing Edgewater there. <laughs> but anything we uh, can do for the city, we're here to do that for the city collectively. And I speak on behalf of the board and speak, obviously, our, our CEO. Uh, we're here for you. So at this time, I will introduce you to all of you to the mayor of this city, Mayor Eddie Milton. No pressure. <laughs> from our prosecutor, uh, to Dr. Woods, to the Board of Directors, Congressman Mervan, and Prosecutor Carter, thank you so much, and congratulations. Congratulations on a very special day. Uh, this, For me, this is coming full circle with so many fronts. Like Dr. Woods mentioned, um, let me start from the beginning, before I even worked there. I grew up on 7th and Tyler, so I will walk past Holy Angels Cathedral, through the parking lot of the police department, through the parking lot of this building next to the police department for four years going to Horace Mann High School, not knowing the work that was going on in that building. Fast forward, leaving college, that was the first job I had was at Edgewater. Uh, working on... <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> no, but it, it exposed me to so many opportunities, but also to the vulnerabilities of this community, which I was not uh, shy of knowing. Mm -hmm. Knowing that we are all just one blink away from a crisis. Yeah. We're just one heartbeat away from recalling trauma in our lives that may trigger other incidents. So the work that Edgewater has done for over 50 years is something that we should commend them on every single day, and we're grateful for that. Another full circle that I wanna just mention I served as state senator for eight years and had the opportunity to pass one of the last budgets, uh, I believe in 2023. And in that budget was significant funding to help undergird and support mental health support throughout the entire state, myself along with Representative Smith as well. But serving as ranking minority member on the state budget committee, I heard testimonies of individuals that would come in and talk about if there was another number I could have called instead of 911, would my child be here today? Mm -hmm. And this is an example of this resource or that tool in the toolbox is being presented uh, before our community. So as mayor, it is truly an honor to be able to say that we have this resource in the city of Gary. 
and we'll do all that we can, especially as we grow and strengthen and undergird our, our Geary Health Department to come alongside of Edgewater and our other partners to figure out how do we further support that effort. So again, I just want to say congratulations. I know this is just one step closer to a larger uh, investments that can possibly be made throughout the region and throughout the city of Gary. But as mayor, I'm, I'm happy to say that we have it right here in our own backyard. So again, thank you so much. I'd like to say again, thank you to Dr. Shirley, to Mayor Melton, Congressman Mervan, and Lake County Prosecutor Bernard Carter. Now, Bernie did mention something about training. And in the past, we've been a part of the CIT group that focused on training with Methodist Hospital way back when, training police officers on how to intervene with, when there's a psychiatric crisis. Today, right before our meeting, we had a presentation from the Lake County CIT team, who, some who, who are represented in this meeting, um, Chris Carroll in the back, Denise Diller. And so when we talk about training, where is Rebecca? Is she still here? She may have left. She's with NAMI. But when we talk about training, we have those resources that what, as well. We'd be able to help coordinate, facilitate, or you can go directly to them. But we're going to make sure we want our police officers trained. We want our law enforcement officials trained so that they can deal with these situations in a safe and humane manner. And we always must keep in mind, humane. We want to deal with them in a humane way. And, you know, I just like to say, when days get hard, we have the answer. There is a video that I'd like to show you briefly. It's only three minutes. Some of you have seen it. Some of you have seen it twice. Many of you have not seen it. But it will kind of describe for you in detail what crisis response is all about. And it's a more simplistic view, but... Should you want more detail about that and to see other videos, we have all kinds of resources that you can take advantage of. But I'm going to ask Karen if she would just cue that up really quickly. Have you ever seen what happens when it comes to managing a crisis? Most often, law enforcement and first responders are called to the scene. But what would it be like if a crisis is handled differently when days get hard? Now more than ever, our citizens struggle with mental and emotional challenges. Every day, thousands experience the acute symptoms of mental illness. How people are treated not only affects them, but also our entire community. Traditionally, the emergency response systems, primarily the police and first responders, are called upon first. But most don't have the training or expertise to effectively help them. So what happens? The person in crisis is often hauled off to jail or put in a mental health hold at a hospital emergency room. It's not only terrifying for that person, but likely ineffective at dealing with the crisis. Mental health awareness and techniques have improved dramatically. Our treatment of people in their hour of need must change as well. That is our mission at Edgewater Health, compassionate whole person care. We've implemented an innovative approach, the Crisis Relief Hub, where we're revolutionizing crisis support services. The Crisis Hub at Edgewater offers more choices, lowers health care costs, takes the weight off the judicial system, and reduces overcrowding in emergency rooms because it is specifically designed to meet the challenges of mental health emergencies. The Crisis Relief Hub is built on three pillars. The Crisis Call Hotline, Mobile Crisis Response Teams, the Crisis Stabilization Center. The Crisis Call Team is a group of seasoned professionals who are trained to help the caller in crisis. As the first point of contact, they're quick to help. They evaluate the crisis and dispatch the right resources to the location when needed. The mobile crisis response team is trained to go into the community, intervene, and offer assistance to the person where they are. They reduce stigma by removing the image of a fleet of police cars showing up to someone's home. This helps the person by reducing the level of response, making people more open to receiving help. The mobile response team staff is comprised of clinicians and people with lived experience, typically resolving the crisis on the spot. Finally, our Crisis Stabilization Center is uniquely equipped to serve people at the peak of their crisis. Here, they receive short-term care and support. Our center is open 24-7 to people who may be in all states of crisis. Once stable, they leave, with resources that help them manage their mental health and avoid future crisis episodes. Let's look at how this impacts Lake County, Indiana. 
The county has a population of approximately 500,000 people. It's estimated that around 2.4% or 12,000 of these will experience a mental health episode. The current system uses jail or hospitalization as the resource for those in crisis. The average cost for an acute care hospital bed in Indiana is $3,175 per day. These days are generally six days. This costs the system an astounding $230 million each year. Edgewater's Crisis Relief Hub is anticipated to reduce the cost to the community exponentially. With over 50 years of experience, Edgewater Health has found a better way. To learn more about the Crisis Relief Hub, visit edgewaterhealth.org or call 844-4-EDGEWATER, 844-433-4392. Thank you all for coming. I want you to know that if you want to stick around, there will be tours of the facility every 15 minutes. So we've got some tour guides, and Karen will help us point those tour guides out. Uh, oh, they're standing in the back. And so if you'd like to kind of take a, uh, a deeper look at what the facility has to offer, please get with one of those young people, and they will help you out. And again, thank you so much. We are only as successful as we can be with the community support, with all of your support, your efforts, your, your questions, your comments, you know, even if there are things you have to